Hello everyone, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta, I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, today's panel is on circular economy business models and practice with perspectives from USA and UK. And our moderator today is Emma Burlow. She's the head of circular economy at Resource Futures. Uh, she's going to talk to Robert Goodwin, who's co-founder and president at Ocean Cycle, and uh, Annie Beavis, who's a founder at Honeymaker. And uh, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction of what how the panel will go on. We will be taking your questions. In fact, we've allotted quite a lot of time for your questions. So please use the Q&A section. Put down your questions there. Even if you've shared your questions in advance, that's okay. If it hasn't been answered in the panel, please put it down there. And if you haven't seen uh, the other panels that Emma has been part of in Be Waste Rise, please head to the video panel section of our website. She's moderated one more panel for us and she's been a panelist on another one. So that's it. I'm handing this over to Emma now. Oh, that's great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, great to see so many people joining. We've got about 60 people joining so far. Hopefully a few more will join us. So this afternoon, or this afternoon from, for us, we're uh, coming from all different time zones in, in the world today. So that's great. We're going to be talking about circular economy business models um, in practice, which is a really important uh, point. I wanted to do this uh, webinar today to talk to people who are at the coalface. Um, so I'm really pleased to have Annie and Robert joining me from uh, opposite sides of the Atlantic. So um, I'll start with Robert. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Robert uh, works for or founded an organisation called Ocean Cycle. Um, he has worked in senior positions across government, non-profit and business. So he's coming at uh, this from sort of three perspectives. He's a global traveller, though I guess not so much at the moment, Robert, having uh, travelled to over 70 countries and worked extensively in 30. So really interested to get your view um, on the global piece. Um, he's helped establish plastic recycling in the country of Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. Um, and he founded Ocean Cycle about three years ago. Um, he's focused on integration of business and purpose um, and comes from the belief that purpose can be profitable. So. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for joining us. Um, before I hand over to Annie, I think, Robert, you've got a little video that you uh, wanted to, to share with us to tell us a bit more about Ocean Cycle. Can we play that? Sure. Right. I think we'll also put the link to the uh, video in the chat. So don't worry if, if you're having any technical problems, but it should join us any minute now. It's only two minutes. Great, thanks. Oh, we don't have sound. No audio, Swetha. Were you not able to hear the sound? No, there wasn't any audio. Oh, okay. Hang on. I'm going to try that again. Okay. We'll try it once more. If not, we'll put the, pop the link in the chat and then people can grab it later. Hi to everyone who's just joined us. There's still people joining. We're just going to watch a little short video um, about Robert's uh, organization called Ocean Cycle, but we're just having a couple of audio problems. So I think my MacBook's giving me a bit of a trouble. So I'm going to put the link down on chat so all of you can have a look at it. Right. Perfect. Well, okay. Well, it was an amazing video and was just going to be so inspiring for your days wherever you it are. It is a great video, to yeah. be fair. Um, but what this talks about is really kind of how we're engaged in the circular economy. So what we call the ocean cycle. And first, I just want to say thanks, Emma, for, for having me here. Really excited to be part of this. And thanks, everyone, for joining um, but what we call the ocean cycle is uh, first and foremost to deal with the ocean plastic problem. We have to make sure that there's demand for plastic that prevents, you know, pollution in the first place. And once you have demand that then incentivizes collection at the lo in the local communities. Uh, and when you start incentivizing collection that creates a lot of local jobs. People have more income for food. They can send their kids to school. Um, they can buy seeds for planting. And then as you have a lot of people collecting plastic, that gives you a lot of material that you can then process back into flake and pellet. As you then have all that raw material, you can work with manufacturers to pr produce new goods. 
And then as you sell those goods, it ultimately creates more demand. And that's kind of the ocean cycle and the, and the circular way we're looking at this. And if, and if you're not working on every part of that, um, it, it all breaks down. So for example, there's a lot of people that see plastic on the beach and they want to clean it up, which is an amazing thing. Um, but if you aren't taking that somewhere where someone will pay for it and then someone will ultimately recycle it, you know, the, the collection process is going to break down. At the same time too, you can have amazing machinery that can process plastic back into an amazing flake or pellet that's easy to manufacture with. But if you don't have a healthy collector force, um, and uh, especially in these times where we had to make sure people had food and, and personal protective equipment, if you don't have healthy people that are collecting, it's also going to break down. Or if you have people that are collecting it improperly, you're going to have all kinds of contaminants as well as impurities in that plastic. And then when it gets to a manufacturer, it's going to break down. At the same time, if you don't have uh, a company that is uh, cost effectively able to get this material and at volume when they need to produce it, it also will break down. So we are have you know worked on a certification process to really give people insight into where this plastic is coming from and how it's collected, but we also work on all those different parts of that circular economy, you know, to make it work. Um, I do, uh, I did put a poll question together for the audience because I'd love to get your involvement where we had a question just in terms of recycling what you think is most important in uh, uh, for things to get recycled. Uh, do you want okay, me to so do the poll yeah, now? Did you, did you do that poll? Yeah, why not? Let's do that. So Robert, from what I heard, I was really uh, pleased to hear that, but uh, you know, you just summed up the circular economy, you know, so you said we need to retain value in, in this circular system and the stakeholders in that system are absolutely crucial. So over to the, the poll, but I just wanted to say that, you know, what you've said is just summed up why we're here really. So that's really, really great introduction. Thank you. So over to the poll. Um, while we're on the top, top, we've jumped straight into the topic of plastic and recycling, which is about as topical as you can get. If you're interested in maximizing plastic recycling, what's the most important factor to you or your organization? So really simple, but really crucial, I think. I think there's also quite a lot of misunderstanding maybe out there as to what's, what's important. I can't vote, so I'm gonna wait and see what other people think. Right. Well, that is an interesting uh, um, result so far. Thanks everyone for kind of putting together that. So number one, packaging design, I think 36%, proper collection, 23% and processing. And this is somewhat of a trick question, a trick poll. I don't mean to trick you all, but it's really that all of these are important. Wow. Um, and, and so, you know, but uh, so for, number one is like packaging design. So if you have a multi-layer packaging that has many different types of plastic or many different layers, it's obviously going to be harder to, um, to recycle. At the same time too, and I know in the United States and, and also in the UK and other places, like we're accustomed to taking our plastic and we're separating it, being good citizens, but we all put it in the same bin. It goes to the municipality, they crush it all together, and then it goes to some type of municipal facility to try to separate it so it can be recycled and it becomes very hard once it's been crushed together and contaminated with other types of plastic that for the most part, it, it makes it very difficult to recycle, which is part of the reason like in the countries where we work, we can actually train people to separate polypropylene from HDPE from PET plastics at the source. And then we can have very clean bales of material going through the processing um, that ultimately creates higher quality on the back end. At the same time too, you can have all the best collection in the world and really single level packaging. But at the same time too, if you don't have a processing capability that's good enough and gets hot, the water hot enough to get rid of the contaminants that um, can have those additional sorting capabilities and separation, you're gonna have quality problems on the back end. And that was one of the challenges when I worked in Haiti, we had an amazing system where we were processing plastic into you know, flake that could go to a manufacturer, but it, it, they had really inconsistent quality, had high humidity, and so it caused all these problems with manufacturers. So they had to dry the material multiple times, they had to extrude it multiple times. So it became really difficult to, um, to get them to use it. And they said, hey, we want to do something for Haiti, but it's 
uh, but we can't have this kind of complexity in our supply chain. So here's one example of a really cool company that just launched called Zen Water. This bottle is made out of 100% ocean bound plastic, but they also did some really cool innovations such as this cap here. Normally a cap in water bottles is, is this is PET plastic and then this is HDPE plastic. And they made this entire bottle out of PET plastic, which is just something. And they also have some innovation in the label that makes it really easy to recycle as well. Um, but something to think about too is that, see, this is a very clear type of bottle. So if I'm trying to recycle this, um, I can turn it into almost any color because it's, I'm starting with clear or light blue, I can always go darker. But when I'm in Ecuador, there's certain bottles out there that are energy drinks that are purple and a dark purple. So if I'm trying to recycle that, I can't take a dark purple bottle and then make it clear. I can only make it brown or black for the next product. And I think that's something to be um, looked at in the circular economy is, is we have to, even though we're trying to encourage recycling, if we can encourage bottlers, maybe the innovation for the bottlers and color should come from the label instead of the bottle itself, because then it becomes easier, you know, to recycle. So, but anyway, good, 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 awesome, you know, product and, and uh, we're excited about that. You know, at the same time too, we're also excited for people to use reusable bottles. So while we are focused on increasing the amount of global recycling, we're also advocating for other technologies, things like huh. PHA, which is an organic biopolymer that operates just like plastic to replace some of those single use plastics. Because, you know, a lot of the materials we're working on collecting, there's a value to them. Sometimes when you get to films and, and plastic foam, uh, there's, they're very light and very low quality plastic. So it's really hard to pay people to, to pick them up. So that's when we work on chemical recycling options or waste energy or ultimately replacement with uh, biodegradable alternatives. Um, so, uh, but it's a, it's a system that we have to look at all aspects. That's great. I mean, what a great introduction, Robert, because I think you've covered so many things there, quality, innovation, markets. You know, it's really set us up for, for a, good, uh, a good hour's debate, I think. I'm going to introduce our next, uh, thank you, Robert, for that. And do grab the video, everybody, if, if you can. I'm going to introduce my next panelist, um, Anne, Anne Beavis from the UK. Anne's the founder of Honeymaker, a responsible marketing and business development consultancy in the UK. Uh, she works with businesses that are looking to grow in a positive way, much like Robert, uh, with small, I uh, like this, small leaps, uh, small steps or giant leaps. I really like that. Um, Anne's been working in the sector for over 20 years and the last 10 years, the reason why I invited her today, She's been working on focusing to support organizations seeking to develop more responsible and circular business models. Um, in particular, she fulfills the role of head of sustainable development for Crown Workspace and has helped them devise and grow their office furniture, IT reuse, refurbishment, remanufacturing and resale offering um, that now revenues over two million pounds a year. Um, and and won an award from the, the Queen's Award for Enterprise for Sustainable Development. So Anne knows what it's all about at the coalface um, and you know in a completely different sector to, to Robert, uh, furniture and IT it's not an easy space to work in. Um, so Anne, is, you know, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been doing recently? Yeah, no, absolutely. And thanks for the introduction and lovely to hear what Robert's doing in, in plastics as well. And actually to the point that Robert was talking about, generating demand and supply. That's kind of the role that I've been fulfilling in a different sector because so many of the businesses that are, you know, there's lots of good startups doing new innovation in circular economy. And I'm sure we'll touch on that later, but the majority of goods and services we buy are from existing businesses that are needing to change or pivot as the word is, or, you know, completely, you know, make a radical alteration in their path. But to do that, the economics have to stack up, the supply chain have to stack up, the clients have to stack up. And so I really look at sort of existing sort of business to business models and, and when, you know, in particular with Crown, but with other clients as well, when there's a desire to be more responsible or sustainable, um, you, have to, you have to consider all of the what's existing. You can't, if you can design from scratch, that's lovely. Um, and I think it's really important, you know, looking at circularity, it's become so important and much more mainstream, although the majority of people still don't know what you mean by circular economy. So you have to, you know, communicate to an audience wider than those that are environmentally concerned. And I think that's the area that I really feel um, 
needs more focus. You need to sell sustainability. You need to sell circularity. You need to, you know, make those concepts much more mainstream. Um, but, but, but also when you're looking at developing business models to be circular, you have to put the client right at the very, or the customer right at the heart of it. You can get, you know, it's great to get carried away in, in, in developing it to be circular, but people still have to engage with that, even from the supply chain or, or, or making that procurement decision. You have to be as good at what you are going to be already, as well as being circular, or even if not better, to help people change their mind. So I love working on business cases that make circular products and services better than the original. And, and to the point with furniture, we've got the, at Crown Workspace, we, they've built and invested in this, uh, a remanufacturing and refurbishment facility. 15 people, full time, highly skilled. And when they take furniture apart, they see what war, you know, elements of it that got worn, bits that got broken. So when it gets put back together, it gets put back together with, with almost love and care and attention. It gets almost put back together better. And I think that's what I really, you know, that's some, there's some really positive things about the circular economy, changing existing business models and making them better. That's great. Yeah, yeah, really good. And I, and I understand because you come from a marketing and business development background as well. Um, I think that's, you know, really, really important. We need the technical people, we need, uh, you know, the partnership people, but we also need the commercial business, business case people. Um, yeah. You mentioned there that, you know, people don't even mention, talk about circular economy and the term. So, you know, my first question to you both, and it doesn't have to be a long, a long answer, but how do you help people understand what a circular business model is? And should, you know, should we, do you even use that term? And particularly you, Robert, does it work globally? Uh, I think that people are getting more and more concerned about where does this go after I use it. And so I would say I, I, I probably have more conversations about end of life than I do necessarily circularity, but I think circularity, that concept is becoming more and more, you know, prevalent in society. But I, I would say that, um, and I, I would say to the point that, that you know, Anne was talking about is that, um, it has to, we tend to work with procurement departments versus marketing departments. There's an authentic story behind this, but if it doesn't work for procurement, you know, if marketing's trying to drive a solution, a company might do it once or twice because there's a great story. But if procurement is driving it and, and you win over procurement, they'll do it every day. And then the great thing is that then there's an authentic story that happens for a very long time because a lot of these efforts in the world of circularity and this is where a lot of the criticism is around greenwashing is because someone does something one time they do a big pr release and then you ask them like a couple years later or whatever are they still doing it and they're not and i think that that's really important and i think that's you know i know ann's been really focused on that and i think that's something that's truly critical and i think that a lot of that is if you are leveraging someone's existing business model that makes it much easier for them because their vendors already understand their quality standards. They already understand their logistics requirements, where if you're trying to create a whole new supply chain that they have to adapt to, uh, it's, it's a much more difficult situation and there's much more risk. And, and a lot of times it takes people within these companies to push it forward. And because there's someone out there that has to be the first one to say yes. And if you're making it so difficult for that person, Versus if I just say to them, hey, look, go to your existing vendor and just ask for this one specific thing in your bill of lading, it can happen. But if I say, here's the 17 different things you've got to do uh, to make this work, it just, it, it becomes too complex and, and it's harder, it's much easier for them to say no than it is to say yes. Yeah, that's great. I think I've spent, you know, the last five years being asked to write business cases for circular economy, you know, circular business models. And I think on paper, that's, that's all fine, but it's almost, if you need to write a business case, it, it's not going to happen, you know, cause it, it ought to be obvious enough. And certainly now, maybe not 10 years ago, maybe. Um, but that whole case about trying to squeeze it in, make it viable, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a premium on it, all those sorts of things. It just, it just kills it dead in the water. So, it, you know, um, so we need to start changing our, our you know, our, our thought process around that, um, rather than trying to compare it all the time and say, well, we could do this, but it's going to cost more. We need to kind of streamline it. And Annie, do you talk about circular business models or do you? It's a, 
it depends on the audience, Emma. I mean, you know, in a in a room full of people who are, who know the subject, I will talk about it. In you know, more broadly in business, I might reference sustainable sustainable services. I might talk about reuse because I think everyone can really understand that extending the life of items, designing them to be reused more. Um, it it just depends on the audience. I do think language is really really important. So it, because you know, you know, used is not a great word. You know, people have, it has got negative connotations, which is why, you know, I will try and talk about refurbished or renewed items. It, but I think circular economy, people are started. My son, I've seen my something my son was doing in geography GCSE level, and that these kind of concepts are starting to feed in, even if it's just at a very you know early stage. So it's more the adults that need, you know, explaining of the terminology. But again, it's 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 really mainly more in the sort of environmental sustainability sector, I think, where you know people comfortably use the terminology. Um, I've just finishing you know an internal comms program for people to want to explain what uh, what it means and put it into terms. And sometimes you have to sit and think, you take this language for granted yourself. How how do you really communicate this to other people? And I think one of the challenges at the moment people hearing a, not, a lot around net zero carbon as a topic or and trying to align the message around circular economy as a strategy to achieving that. That's another, you know, another part of the communication issue. But I think, mm -hmm. that, you know, in general terms, reusing, extending the value of the assets, stuff that our grandparents did anyway and that other communities do. So it makes a lot more sense to people in those terms. Sorry, I muted. Yeah, definitely. So we're in unusual times okay so um robert's had to stop traveling to 70 countries and not added many more on this year i'm sure robert um what do we think how is that affecting you know circular economy or, or how do we think it's going to evolve in the next few months let's just say things are happening really fast so are we going to come out of this with you know renewed vigor around circular business models or have they been put on the back on the back burner because of COVID and the pressures that, that businesses are under? Annie, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I mean, probably like anything at the moment, the um, you know, the, the looking glass trying to look into the future is almost impossible. Um, I think there there's been a lot of um, un greater understanding about supply chain fragility through COVID. And I think if you just look at supply chain and how globalized it is, but what that means when there's something like COVID occurs, I think that is a, is a positive driver for circularity because I think people need to recognize, A, if, if we don't need so much stuff because we're using it better and for longer or sharing it more, that will put some resilience into the supply chain. If we want supply to be more local, resilient, we want it to perhaps be more localized at times. So how do we have more of a take back um, and refurbished type element come into it. So for, for those reasons, from a sort of supply chain resilience perspective, I think that will be a driver for circular circularity. Um, if, I think if you look at the fact, the sort of personal aspect of lockdown and people's awareness of nature and the environment and climate, I think a lot more people are open to looking at what needs to be done to bring, you know, greater well-being um, and I think, you know, they might be looking at lots of different strategies, of which hopefully, you know, circularity will fall into that as well. But also, I just think that, um, you know, the demand, you know, demand for um, change in, in, in general, how we procure things. I think people are just looking at how wasteful their life is. They're stuck at home and they've got so many, so much stuff and none of it can make it happy. So maybe, I'm, maybe that's just wishful thinking, but I'm hoping some of the sort of softer elements and then the harder real business realities will all support, you know, you know a greater shift, but who knows? Yeah, great. I like the philosophy behind that. And I think you're right. And, you know, I've been talking a lot in recent weeks about uh, transparency you know, we're seeing, you know, um, increased activism, that sort of thing. And, you know, have an opinion on it as you will, but it, it's certainly having an impact on brands. And they're certainly asking questions that they maybe didn't ask 12 months ago. And because they know they're going to have to come back in a different way anyway, it's it's kind of opened the door a little bit. I, just, I, think. I was just one thing on what I, I was supporting someone with a tender uh, a sort of, 
corporate procurement process during lockdown and there were 10 questions on circularity. I have never seen that in 20 odd years working with all sorts of different procurement processes from a business to business perspective, 10 questions on circularity. So that, you know, that was a, a lift for me during the darker times. Oh, you've arrived, Danny. You know, that's it. Robert, what, you know, how, how has your business been affected and, and how's it going to evolve in the next, the next sort of six to 12 months, do you think? Well, I do agree with Annie that I think there is this consciousness from consumers and the citizens in general that um, what we do on this planet matters and has a lot of effects that we might not think about. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been a little bit um, disappointed in terms of how with a lot of the fear around the virus, uh, reusable products like reusable bags, many stores were outlawing them, going to single use plastic. So there's been this kind of explosion of single use plastic as well as petroleum prices are low. So there's a glut on the market of really cheap virgin plastic. And I think a lot of the companies are like, oh, we're going to use virgin plastic because of COVID and we want to keep our people safe. But I think it was really, it's been a strategy more to um, make more money in a, in, and unfortunately, and I think there's also a glut of recycled plastic flake on the market because people are not shopping at stores and so goods are not being produced. So there's, there's an excess supply, which is further hurting things. But what most people don't know is that most of the recyclers in places like Indonesia have shut down. And, and, you know, and I also think too, because people aren't traveling there as much and showing people all the pictures of all this plastic in the environment that if not collected will end up in the water and the exponential risk to our planet when that plastic gets in the water. Because most people think you can just take plastic from the water and then recycle it, but you can't. It gets degraded by salt, light, toxins attached to it, microorganisms. It pretty much becomes a recovery and, and a cleanup effort versus a recycling effort once the plastic gets in the water. Uh, but if we get it right before, we can recycle it. Um, but it's only because of some of our partners in Europe that did long-term contracts with some of our processors in uh, Indonesia that anyone is operating there at all. And if you think about these communities, these people are living on the edge. I mean, they are, if they don't have money, they do not eat. I mean, and it's like, we, and we have to kind of think about that even if there was some recycling in these countries, it's a very vulnerable system. So what I, and there's a lot of these companies out there that make commitments that they're gonna add all this recycled content into their products, but they're not doing it. And this is the thing that we as consumers and shareholders and others have to push them. And part of it is, is that a lot of companies are short term in their mindset. So if I'm a, a senior leader within a company, if I can save money on my packaging and make more profit, I will get rewarded. Um, and I think we have to kind of look at what's the cost and putting some producer responsi responsibility back on them so they will make better choices in the long term. Because like Zen Water that I showed, what I love about them and kind of Annie touched on this is they have put sustainability and protecting the ocean as part of their core brand purpose. And I think that more brands need to say, look, we can make money and help the world. If we're just focused on making money, you know, then we're, we're going to hurt the planet. But there's like a pendulum and it's like, here's making money and here's purpose. If you're all purpose and you don't make money, the business will shut. At the same time, if you're all money and you're not purpose, there's going to be long-term consequences for your brand. And I think we need to be kind of like right here, which is you're making money, but purpose is what, if you have to make a decision as a company in terms of whether or not you're going to choose money over purpose, you have to have that guiding principle in light that chooses purpose. And I think for some of these legacy brands and older companies, it's much harder to do, but it's nice to see some innovation from some of the younger startups that are disrupting and saying, yeah. hey, we're going to take on the bottled water industry. We're going to take on the clothing industry. And, and I think there's going to be major disruption coming. And I just think we have to be cognizant. And I hope, I mean, that, I mean, if, if companies really want to make a difference, order some plastic from Indonesia right now. It's amazing quality, but that is how you can, help this problem. If we don't do that, we're going to see explosions of plastic in the ocean uh, coming in the, in the coming months and years. And we have yeah. to. Yeah, I, I think I think this is, you know, everyone's saying 2020 is uh, exceptional year. But if anything uh, positive has come out of it, I've seen a lot of disruption this year. And I think the door has been kicked open. And I think that's great. Um, and you know i think there's going to be some tussles and i think there's going to be some winners and losers but i think you know i think you're right robert i think it's it's um and also you know interesting to see how it's going to play out in different countries around the world 
because what we're you know what what i'm seeing is countries now moving their efforts to sell product into developing markets and starting to bring refill and reuse into say europe where people have cotton you know cottoned on that they don't want single-use plastics but flooding other markets with SUPs. so we won't go down, we haven't got time to go into that today but i just you know i wanted to get that flavor of of, of the differences globally it's not a level playing field in terms of and so if you're speaking to a brand who's heavily invested in in emerging markets and that's where their growth is going to come from it's a really different commercial conversation than if they're maybe you know putting ref refill into norway or germany or denmark or the uk um so i want to move over to some of the questions on the q a because there's been a, quite a few um, and then I'll come back with my kind of like final question, I think. But should we just do um, a second poll? And I had a poll and it sort of fits with what we've, what we've segued into nicely here, which is about behavior change, really. Robert, you picked up on purpose, um, you know, sustainability more broadly. Circular economy has got to fit in this whole kind of um, plethora, different things are going on. So I only wanted to ask, we're all humans, right? We, we work in businesses, but at the end of the day, decision makers are still mainly humans. So what drives your own sustainable behaviors most? Is it what you see from campaigns and activism? Is it what you read, documentaries or see? So Blue Planet clearly had an enormous impact on, on behaviors, both personal and business really good products that focus on sustainability and you can think of this from a business point of view as well i often get um, asked by companies well if it, you know if there was something on the market we would buy it the chances are there is something on the market you just don't know about it yet or you know are we going with the with the crowd is it what our peers do do you need to wait until other people break rank in your industry before you can follow them so have a go at that I think I'd struggle to answer that, Annie. <laughs> but you know, it's it all, in a way similar to Robert's, you know, all of them probably are, you know, have a role, but I think it's, you know, on an honest reflection, what actually makes you do something rather than thinking about doing something. Um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's it is really that good. good. Yeah, no, do you know what? I, 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 my sense, this, you know, my sense is actually it was going to be, you know, it would perhaps be about really good products. This goes to the point that I think things yeah. have to be really good at what they do and be sustainable, not just be sustainable. You know, I, I, I go out and try or circular. I try lots of different products and, uh, you know, I'll I want to ad be an advocate for circular products, particularly in the domestic environment. Um, I will go around. I've, it's been known when you're allowed to have parties and barbecues and stuff that I will take my toilet paper and leave it in friends because it's got very strong social and environmental messages on the wrapping of that. But, you know, I'll try and do things to test and share knowledge about it. But if a product isn't really good at what it does, it doesn't, I don't, I think it's, if being circular is a, is a relevance, it's got to be good at that. So yeah, yeah. that's really interesting findings. Yeah, that's good. I um I find that really interesting. So one of the debates I, I'm working with um, a brand at the moment, and it's this whole um well, I, I'm calling it. It's not me. It's it's not you. It's me. So so a lot of brands will say, well, we would do it, but the customers aren't demanding it. And all you see, all the evidence you see, is the customers saying, well, we would buy it, but there's nothing to buy. You know, I go into my supermarket and I can't find an alternative. And if there is an alternative, it's twice the price. So we're stuck in this real thing and you see it with plastics as well. Oh, it's not, it's not us. It's the lit, it's the litter, you know, it's the litter problem. It's the consumer yeah. and the consumer demands these products. So we only making what the consumer demands and the consumer saying, I didn't even know I needed this product a year ago, but now you've given it to me. Yeah, I'll buy it. So there's a real, I think there's, there's definitely some work to go there in terms of, you know, who's leading this. And, and interestingly that, you know, the consumer is starting to, fight back a bit I think so but, um I was gonna say but Emma on that also sometimes you know while I think it can be product led to a certain degree there's loads and loads of room for innovation when hmm. you know just understand whenever I always think whenever waste is generated it represents market failure so every every scenario where waste is generated there's a product or service 
or relationship that's missing. And it goes to Robert's point again, right at the start about bringing in the demand and the supply. And if you listen to your customers and talk to them and understand what they want, it, it, you know, making that a really central part of your continual service innovation or product development process, then you'll find those bits that make your product stand out anyway, as, as part of that. Um, yeah. yeah. I think you're right. I think there's loads of exciting stuff. Us. Absolutely tons to go at. And I think we're just, um, you know, the real challenge is, is disruption and is being able to disrupt that. And, you know, we are, we are operating in a, in a huge legacy environment. So, you know, literally turning the tide on things and that, that's difficult to do. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to go over to Q and A. Um, there's quite a few in there now. So let's have a look. Um, there was an early one came through um about plastics there's a couple here for you robert um i think this was directly after the poll so there's a question there is the end product also important if there's no well this sort of talks to a little bit of the consumer demand if there was no demand for the product made from recycled content then surely they won't be collected for recycling sure. i saw some questions about uh biopolymers yeah so we, should we go there if you want to go there. Yeah, I, well, I mean, <laughs> you I think that, me. it's really contentious. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot of confusion out there uh, in the biopolymer kind of space, like, for example, um, and, I th and I think to get back to the purpose with performance, like how many of you know, raise your hand virtually, you know, if you hate paper straws, you know, it was an, it was an attempt, I think, to do the right thing, but the performance of the paper straws weren't there. So then you had straws made out of something called PLA, which is compostable, but not biodegradable. Mm. And the downside is it's not like home compostable. You have to have an industrial composter for it to break down. And a lot of people don't know that. So if you don't have on your college campus or in your community, if you don't have a commercial composter, it'll operate just like plastic. And we're really excited about some products like PHA, which are both water safe uh, and environmental safety, you can home compost them. And, and what's good is they, they will stay on the shelf forever because they only break down when bugs eat it. So wherever there's microorganisms, mm -hmm. that's what causes them to break down. And it's like humans can eat it, animals can eat it. So there is some period of time that it will break into the environment, but it's a natural product and it's a natural you know, kind of polymer. The challenge is there's not enough PHA in the world right now. So they, the companies that have been involved in this have been raising lots of money in order to increase their production. But when they're at full capacity, it's gonna be cost competitive with polypropylene. So you will have a straw that is a, a home compostable item, but it performs just like a plastic straw. And I think like, and the same with a lot of single use packaging. And, I, and, and you know, I'm one of these people that wants to minimize the use of plastic, but I also have to recognize that um, Plastic helps protect our food. It helps keep food around longer. So if we suddenly got rid of all plastic in the grocery stores, we would have a lot more food waste that would drive up global food prices. And those that are living at the margins would have higher food prices and would be even more uh, suffering from that standpoint. So I think we have to look at, um, uh, and I think that's where this kind of circularity perspective also has to come in is like, we can't just have one intervention. We have to think about like the, mm. what are the second and third order consequences of the things that we advocate for and the things that we do. Emma, you're muted. Thank you, Robert. Um, there's another question here, Robert, while you're on that, the subject of plastics, which was around um, the trend for cheap oil at the moment and the virgin price being lower. So I don't know if you would just want to give a quick you know, a quick viewpoint on that in terms of the next six to 12 months. Yeah, and so I think this is an absolutely critical issue, especially with the research showing that by 20, so right now, I'm sure you all have seen that statistic, like 8 million tons of plastic enter the ocean every year. That is due to triple by 2040 if we don't do something. And one of the key things we can do is to use more recycled plastic. But because of production, because of the glut on the market, because of oil prices, virgin plastic is so cheap right now. And it's, an, it's a huge threat to the recycling industry because if all these plants shut down, not only is that bad, but it's like, what's the cost of ramping them back up to be able to operate? 
And I think right now, and you're starting to see this a little bit in Europe where they're putting in recycling minimums that are gonna become law 25 or 30%. And that is hugely helpful to driving the recycling industry. You know, in the United States, uh, there, you know, some of the governors have voted down bills to have some type of recycling content ma uh, that's uh, minimum. And I'm hopeful that uh, in the coming years that will come back and they will vote those into law. And, I, and so uh, the other thing too is bottle deposit programs. I, you know, if a, if a, in the United States, if a state does not have a bottle deposit program, only 90, about 9% of that, those bottles are recycled. If there's a bottle deposit program, it's over 90%. In countries like yeah. Ecuador, where they have bottle deposit programs, there's a huge amount of recycling that goes on. In other yeah. countries, that's, so I think that there are ways to create conditions for that success. Um, and, and maybe there should be some type of tax on those that are using only virgin resin. I mean, I'm not, I'm more for free markets, but I think we have to, where there is a market failure, uh, we need to have some type of intervention um, that will create conditions for, for success. And I, and I liked what you said earlier too about, um, I think all these companies have set these carbon goals. And if you're using recycled material, that's a huge way to get to your carbon you know, offsets. And I think that there needs to be some type of, uh, for those that are recycling, one of the things we're working on is try, try to create some type of plastic credit or carbon credit for those that are doing the right thing, especially in these communities where plastic is burned and all the toxins are getting into our atmosphere. We have to capture the harm and then establish some value. So we are working on some of those things to try to change the economics of recyclers, uh, but yeah. it's still a couple of years away. Yeah, it's, co it's really complex, but I think it's moving fast, you know? So, you know, I've, I keep saying this, but I've never seen things move as fast as they have. And, you know, I've worked in this sector since mid nineties. And I think for the first 15 years, you know, it's pretty much just like that. You know, you recycle it a little couple percent more each year. Um, but now, I, you know, I'm seeing complete change in perspective. And I'm going to answer a question from Andrew Henderson, which talks to this point. True circular processing is virtually impossible to undertake economically without massive subsidies. Your wish to see circular economies will need radical change in the way the industry is structured and will take hundreds of billions. No one will pay. So I think, you know, that's a really great hypothesis. Who's going to pay for this? But your point about, um, you know, taxes is already happening in, in, in the UK or be on a voluntary basis now. But it's it's, um, you know, it's in process to be EU law. Um, whether the UK adopt that is, is anyone's guess. But, you know, I'm seeing companies all the time making investments now in 30, 50, even 100% recycled content. Um, they're struggling to do it because of the virgin price, but they know they've got to go that way. Now, you know, you, there's, there's always going to be leaders and followers in this game. So how long this takes, I don't know. But um, I would say it is changing um, legislatively. I think the other big push that we have underestimated is when these juggernaut corporations turn around and move their money literally from there to there as they are starting to do the impact is enormous and i think at the moment we're all assuming they won't do that and i think time will tell um, you know because they are facing an unsolvable problem so they cannot we know this but they cannot continue their growth in the same way. It's going to have to um, evolve and to do that costs money. But, you know, I, I was having a debate with somebody the other day about who's going to pay. And I said, look, when the, when the marketing budgets for Coca-Cola outstrip Apple and Microsoft combined, I don't have an issue of who's got the money to pay. You know, so it's purely about diverting that effort into a different area and if that area can give you gain you market share and gain you brand pr it's worth millions so yes well, massive challenge but i'm more optimistic than i've ever been that i was going to say uh, you know some of these companies whether it's the alliance with tn plastic waste and some of these other groups have put billions of dollars into recycling infrastructure which is great we appreciate that but right now like the existing infrastructure is incredibly vulnerable. So kind of to Andrew's point, they should take some of that money and bridge this dip because this, this oil prices are not going to stay this low. You know, uh, the glut on the market at some point is going to be reduced by people using what's out there. So, um, but take, 
$200 million and give bridge loans or something like that to the existing recyclers. I know in Haiti, when we had, uh, you know, when I set up recycling there for the country, that there were times when oil prices were very low. And, you know, we were a nonprofit, but we were essentially subsidizing, you know, the cost of collecting that plastic because we knew if it got to a certain lower level, people would stop picking up bottles. And sometimes it got so bad that I had to simply pay stipends to the people that were running these small collection centers to simply not shut their doors. And I think that this is something that is important and we have to recognize that um, I, I love people wanting to invest in infrastructure, but right now there's a major risk to Andrew's point that uh, we need to support those that are in the game right now. And yep. part of it is, is by getting people to have to order and I think it's not just and it's not just Indonesia, it's Thailand, it's Philippines, it's a lot of other places where the majority of the ocean plastic is, is coming. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, I'm going to shift it up to reuse now. Um, and Annie, there's a couple of actually, there's a couple of questions there, Annie, about your comment on the 10 point checklist from the procurement. So I don't know if you can pop that in the chat or you're not allowed to say. No, do you know, I've seen that, but uh, you know, you'll have seen yourself anything on tenders and stuff, you can't you know, I, I shared that because it's something that I found remarkable. I'm, I can't share, um, I can't share the details, but it wasn't, it was a private organisation. It wasn't a public, it wasn't okay. a local authority. It was um, a large corporation, put it that oh, way. What's that, what, can you tell us what sector? Fi financial services sector, okay. which goes exactly. to your point, Emma, about the, yeah. you know, the, what the ESG, you know, I believe, I mean, I, I get like yourself, I've been in working in this sector for many years. Um, I, I, I'm more hopeful than ever before, even at this time. Maybe I'm an optimist, eternal optimist, I don't know. But I think the shift in focus in the financial markets on ESG, you know, uh, environmental and social and governance, those key areas, it's become a massive part of the decision making. And if the money moves, you know, there's people that are being progressive now. But if the money moves, I think that will also act as a, as a great accelerant. And I think you know, increasingly so, circular economy to me is a really, really important strategy of, you know, achieving more sustainable outcomes. But just the wider perspective of looking at all the UN goals, you, can't, you don't tend to be a circular business, but be really rubbish to your staff or, you know, be a really, you know, bad on other areas. It's unethical, I think yeah. That, I think the whole area of responsible and ethical business is becoming increasingly important and then people say well how do you do this if if we want to respond to these UN sustainability goals when you look at the circular economy that actually is a strategy for so many of them not just because it um you know not just because it addresses carbon impacts but it also generates skills and employment you know the, the remaking of things and the, the there's a lot that goes around from a sort of skills base and other softer elements um that circular businesses bring so uh yeah, was there another uh, question on reuse in particular there? I think I was talking um, about challenging the supply of new or replacing. Yeah, there was. And I think it's a really good one. It's from Stephanie Colony saying, how do we ensure reuse business models are designed to dis displace new production? So um, some of the conversations I have around um, substitution of materials or recycling. Um, so, um, or, or, you know, even the debate with Unilever coming out this week saying um, that they're going to, you know, um, substitute and uh, avoid fossil fuels for their product and packaging it's a really big move and it's a carbon related move there'll be some circularity in there because they're going to need to look for novel um, substitutions but um, ultimately they're not changing their consumption model no so there is a debate there around you know the amount of stuff that's still put on a mar on the market and the embodied carbon in that and the fact that you if you went to a reusable refillable model you wouldn't you wouldn't be you know generating that so um so it was really a question around that how do we hang on i scrolled it's gone how do we um focus on reuse when arguably you know a lot of people are focused on material substitution and recycling and that's yeah. why you've done a lot on reuse yeah no exactly and i think you know i always i always try and drive the conversation to sort of looking at reuse both in the domestic environment and in the work environment. Obviously, you know, most of the stuff I've done has been in the workplace. And particularly in a workplace, I think there's a sense of, you know, offices have to be clean and new and fresh, or they did. Um, or products have to be, you know, 
bought and acquired a level of status whether i think products we've associated products with status for a while and this kind of caught up in this consumerism and what it means and i think I think that is something that people are starting to look at, you know, the sense of doing something used or, or why would you go and just order that from a catalogue? It's easy. It looks shiny and it's rubbish and it falls apart, you know, and I've, you know, looking at the stuff I've done with Crown, I suppose I spent 10 years campaigning for reused is as good as new and actually probably better because we're, if to give you an example, the sorts of furniture that we deal with brand new are seven or a chair might be seven or 800 pounds. And offices are full of stuff like that. So they will throw it out because it's a rip or a cut or something, or they want a different colour. You refurbish it, you put it out, it looks as good as new, it's maybe £250. Trying to change the mindset that you spending £200 or even £150 on a used product, as opposed to buying a brand new chair for around that price that's going to fall to pieces in no quick time at all, is, is a difficult debate to have. But actually, I think it it's just about tr getting showing people physically showing people that you know products that are used have got you know been designed for longevity um they've got really good quality put inputs in them it's in a domestic environment it's a lot harder i think you know i will go into charity shops i'll buy things on ebay i'll put things on ebay um and and actually Things like Facebook has made it easier. The Facebook marketplace, I yeah. think that's really, really got a strong place. I mean, there's a lot going on there. And I think it's, as you start to see these models sort of reuse supported by some of the retailers, you know, like IKEA products on, there's a, God knows thousands of people, members of the sort of IKEA reuse network. And IKEA are going in and supporting that by saying, these are the spare parts to fix those bits so you can pass them on to the secondary market. So I just think it's got to be a bit more, it's got to be not, something that's dull it's got to be easy reuses i think reuse is the hardest bit to tackle but if it's made easy if it's made fun if you look at if, if you remind people that they're probably going to spend lots of money on an antique watch you know or a fine fine wine well fine wine won't have been used but fine art or some other element these are all used products and we value them in one way but not in another yeah it goes back to your point about the whole kind of you know tarnish of used and and when we talk about the, you know, the timeline of circular economy, we came out of, of the Second World War and it was all about consume your, you know, consume your way out of it. And now we're talking about coming out of this potential recession and, you know, governments are saying we need to spend our way out of it. So it, there's, there's a huge kind of economic thing here. Um, and quick plug for Donut Economics, if no one, if you haven't read it, read it already, because it gives you a, you know, a completely different view on that. And of course, it's all very well having an economy growing, but if you've broken society and the environment, it's no use to anybody. But I, just, just to add on that, Emma, I think the right to repair and the repair trend is also going to have a significant role in that. I mean, you know, when it becomes mainstream TV to watch, you know, you probably won't have seen it, Robert, but there's a programme on in the UK at the moment where people will watch people repair things. I mean, I would never have thought that that would make prime time viewing. But, you know, when that becomes you know something on tv that gets millions of watches that gives me hope that it, it you yeah. know reuse can become yeah. more trendy perhaps yeah no robert what about the us because i mean we talked you know annie and i are giving you an eu perspective or even a uk perspective you know reuse is on the rise repair is on the rise how do you feel about it in the, in in the us generally um you know i I think you, Europe is so far ahead of the United States. And so it's, it's hard because I'm trying to say, hey, look at what Europe does. It's just like there's a culture in Europe of if you're going to the grocery store, you bring your reusable bags. Oh, yeah. It just doesn't exist in the United States for the most part. We all have a, a, a bunch of reusable bags in our, in our apartments or our homes, but we always forget them. And, and I think part of it is, is that, um, and so I have to start from a default position of how do I make it convenient for consumers? So we are working on some reusable bag projects, but um, you know, the main thing is we have to make it worthwhile for that consumer. And what we're hoping is that as you bring your reusable bag, I can work with a lot of brands and retailers to uh, incentivize that reuse where they get an extra 50 cents off here an extra 25 cents there. So they're getting seven to $8 every time they bring that bag in. And maybe also too, there's also ways of having some type of community to where like, I've got a hundred reuses. How many do you have? And, you know, almost yeah. like you're kind of inspiring each other. And maybe like I've, I've wanted to uh, have like partnerships with something like a lot of kids are playing Fortnite 
And so it's like, can we get some unique special Fortnite skin that only people that are using bags can get? And so their kids are like driving them, mom, dad, you have to do this because I've got to get this new Fortnite skin. You know, I, I just think that, uh, and it's not just in the United States, I think globally we have to look at this. And I think, you know, people are stressed, especially all the people that their kids aren't in school. They're being asked to do more with less. Uh, they have limited time. So we can't think about solving these problems without convenience. So we have to find a way to integrate purpose and convenience. I mean, I think also too, like we talked about, we have to have the same level of quality product. And ideally it costs the same. And you build your market share through the purpose. But I think so many of these projects, whether it's a pair of shoes or whatever else, like it's at the same price, but it's lower quality because it, you know, uh, but it's, there's a great story behind it because they're, you're, you know, you're uh, doing something after someone mm. buys a pair of shoes. But if it's yeah. the same exact price and same quality, but there's more purpose behind it, people will buy that product every day. But when you're making it harder for that consumer uh, to just make the right choice and, and people will pay a little bit more, but you can't charge them double. And that's been kind of some of the Center, yeah, center I was going to say we have the, the the main issue I think we have in the in the EU is that um, you know a more ethical or an environmental conscious product is usually a premium, but um, I think what's interesting goes back to our point about this pushing against the mainstream market. So you know it's all a case of scale up. So you know um, we've meant I think uh, Georgie Hopkins has put a question on here about Unilever and IKEA. Well, those products, you know, their price point can't afford to change because their market you know, will suffer. So I think those those are really interesting companies that you need to get inside of the head of. And I mean, the people like Ben and Jerry's and, and 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 others have done the same, but they're not, you know, they're not flogging the you know cut price ice cream. So but I, but the lines I would say is that maybe like a Unilever, like their packaging costs might go up five percent, but hopefully because of authentic purpose their marketing budget can be reduced 5% to yeah. make it a, a net zero. But the challenge, part of the challenge is, is that when companies are looking at this, everyone has their own budget. It's so complete. like someone else has the marketing budget, someone else has the procurement budget. And, and I think that this is where CSR departments and philanthropy departments can help uh, buy down the risk and, and try, to, try to create some of that synergy. And I, I talked to a company in the UK recently and they were using their CSR dollars directly to pay for that premium and the packaging cost of using ocean bound plastic. And to me, I think that's brilliant. I mean, ideally you don't have to do that. Um, but I think that there are these kind of breakdowns because of how budgeting happens within big companies. I think that's a brilliant point to, to, to wrap up on Robert, because I think you're absolutely right. And this is where purpose has not come from the top. It's come from the side or the, you know, the, the packaging department has said, look, we finally need to do this. Oh, you can't, you know, endlessly, we can't do it this year because we haven't got the budget. We can't do it this year. But like you say, another part of the company will be making a massive investment in something else. So it is just about that integration and actually seeing this as a whole piece of the puzzle. And like I said to Andrew's question earlier, I'm not concerned that the money's not there. I'm just, you know, my goal is to get that money spent in the right way. And if, to go back to Annie's point, you can kill two birds with one stone. Um, and I've never known a company come out with something that's environmentally better and, and have a negative PR result, you know, unless it bombs, you know, unless they get it wrong. But and really, you know, it's like what's not to like about it. Like you say, it's the same quality. It's, you know, it, it's, it's more ethical. You know, what's not to like about it? So I think we just need to work on that. But, you know, you know, these big corporations, it's it's like turning an ocean liner around. So you just need to get in there and uh, you know, make it happen. I mean, I was just going to literally going to wrap up on what three steps and maybe two steps, maybe one step. What would you say to a business organization or an organization? What next step should they take to become more circular? Robert, do you want to? Well, I think if you're using plastic products, I would, I would, we can, you know, it's easy to do the quality and the volumes of material, but I would ask your procurement department, what does it have to do? What do you have to do to make it work? And try to find a way to get those, you really need within these companies an internal advocate because it's hard to get these companies to do it. So I'd say, number one, who's most passionate about this? Or maybe there's five people that are incredibly passionate about it. Try to get a meeting together that involves procurement, marketing, 
and uh, you know, at the CEO level. Because I think sometimes in companies like CSR tries to drive this, but many times the people in the, in the sustainability world or CSR are not the leaders of the company. So you really have to get a group of people that are within the core business that are kind of driving this. So I would say, try to get that group together and see how each of you can participate. And maybe it's the CSR department that if there's a, a gap of $5,000 or 5,000 euros, something that can't make it, that they say, oh, I've got that. And that helps the sustainability leader achieve their objective. So I would say you really need some cross-functional teams. We're happy to help with things like that. And I know Annie probably is too, but, it, but, but we're happy to kind of, even if we're not part of the deal, we're advising companies all the time on how to, how to do things. Right. Annie, what's your top tip? How, you know, I, I would, you know, to be honest, like any major change, I, if the, there seems to be, I would just want to understand why, what anyone's fear of change is. You know, if someone was looking at circularity as an organization, you need to have the complete buy-in from everyone at the top table. And if I had that team round now, you know, I would be asking them what what is it concerns you most? Um, and I can guarantee that because people wouldn't know what to say, the cost would come out. And I think at that point I would, you know, just pop on some slides from World Wildlife Fund or Friends of the Earth or something else and say, look at the cost of not changing and um, and start the conversation from there. Brilliant. Well, I think our time is, uh, is, is nearly here. And I want to say thanks to everybody. Thanks to the over 80 participants, I think. Um, sorry for some of those of you who didn't get your questions answered. I was trying to kind of merge them, but there were probably too many, which is absolutely great, great position to be in. I would say, and I hope I can talk for Robert and Annie, we're more than happy to take questions. I think we're all, um, can all be tracked down on LinkedIn. Um, so by all means, um, you know, seek us out if you didn't uh, get your question answered today. Um, and thanks for taking part, everybody. Um, I am hosting another webinar, uh, but we don't quite have a date for it yet. So let's uh, yeah, keep, keep your eyes peeled on the Be Waste Wise uh, newsletters for that one. Sweater, over to you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, Robert. That was, uh, that was you, I think you packed in so much information in an hour. I'm pretty sure the audience will agree too. And uh, I think this proof enough to see the number of questions that the audience have. And this is information for the audience members. We will take the questions uh, that have not been answered. We are going to send it to all three of them, all the three panelists, and we'll try to get the response. This panel will be up on our website in two weeks. And hopefully we have their answers by then, which will also be up on our website. And as I, Emma mentioned, we're going to have another panel where she is going to moderate. Uh, just follow our website, please sign up for our newsletter and you will get the information. Thanks a lot to everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.